At InDigital, we know that public safety professionals hold themselves to a high standard. In fact, standard doesn't do it justice. In over 25 years working alongside you, carrying millions of calls over our IP networks, your dedication has inspired us. That's why our ESI net goes beyond industry standards, not only I3 compliant, but designed to adapt to future development for a network you can count on when it matters most. Learn more at indigital.net. If Within the Trenches has ever taught you something, open your eyes to what it is like to be a 9-1 dispatcher or has inspired you to become one, then help support us and join our Patreon. Get exclusive bonus content, one-of-a-kind swag, discounts on merchandise, ad-free early access to new episodes, and much more. To join, please visit patreon.com slash WTT podcast. And if you're an industry partner, we have something for you as well. And now for the show. This is Jordan, and you're listening to the Code 7 Podcast Network. Warning. This episode contains the three A's of podcasting. Adult content, adult language, and awesomeness. You've been warned. Welcome to Within the Trenches, true stories from the 911 dispatchers who live there. Hey, what's going on? This is Ricardo with the Code 7 Podcast Network, and this is Within the Trenches, True Stories from the 9-1 Dispatchers Who Live Them. And this episode is sponsored by InDigital, a leader next-gen core services. A big shout-out, as always, to subscribers of the podcast, whether you are on Circle, uh, Facebook, or Patreon. Thank you so, so very much. I wouldn't be able to do what I do if it wasn't for all of you, but especially especially all of you who are watching, listening, sharing, and supporting. I appreciate it. And as always, a lot of stuff going on. Today is July 23rd, 2024. And by the time this one comes out, I mean, it'll be a, it'll be a few weeks before this <laughs> comes out. So when you hear this episode, um, it already have been the 11 year anniversary yesterday, the 22nd, which is also my dad's birthday, uh, was the anniversary 11th anniversary of my last day in dispatch. Um, I retired out, ended up going on to work on the private side of, uh, 911 for in digital as their communications director. And then I been on my own doing all of this for a living and, uh, for about four years now. Yeah. Cause actually, Today is not only the anniversary of the first day I, show, I started with InDigital, but also the last day that I <laughs> that I worked at InDigital. I finished off all of my stuff there. So, wow, uh, I planned it out well. Mm -hmm. Just had it all around the same time. But as always, like I said, a lot of things going on. And also by the time this comes out, this will have come out as well. And that is Imagine Listening. Your worst day is our every day, and that's volume two. There have been so many things going on with this book and the series. And if you're following me on social media, you know. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Maybe I'll do an episode or a bonus episode where I talk about everything else that went through it. But man, it has been hell, but also fun at the same time. A lot of different things. I've learned a lot of different stuff about self-publishing after stepping away from my publisher because of just things that were going on. But uh, you'll find out all about that, and hopefully you pick up a copy of Volume 2. And coming soon will be Ricardo's version of Volume 1. So look out for that. And uh, I'm excited to have my guest on today. And uh, her name is Elizabeth. We were already laughing and everything right <laughs> before I hit record and uh, and we started. And uh, so, like I said, I'm excited to have her on. Uh, again, her name is Elizabeth. She's an author as well as a retired 911 professional. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Oh, how are you? I'm good. Life is good. That is you good. It, life is good, man. We got Sometimes you got to grab hold of it to make it good, but life is good. 
that is very true. And I think that's, that's some of the things sometimes that, you know, a, a, a lot of folks, including myself at times, I think we've all been there, right? Where you just, you get up and you're just kind of looking at the ceiling and like, <clears throat> okay, here we go. Yep. But it's all about that mindset, right? If you get Absolutely. up and out of bed and you're like, let's do this. Even if you're looking up at the ceiling, you're like, ah, oh, here yeah. we go. But you're getting up and you're moving forward. You're doing things. Yes. That mindset, that discipline, consistency, all of it keeps you going. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. The willingness to uh, to look for the good things, like that there's something good out there. Let me go find it. Right. Right. Yeah. There's there's always a silver lining somehow. You you might not see it right away, but right. when you do see it, when you realize it, or maybe sometimes you're just going and going and going and you got to, you have to step back for a moment. Yes. Because you could be living the life that you want to live, but you're just so gung ho, right? Just going forward right. that you can't even see it. Yeah. Get the tunnel vision going and uh, all this stuff, all the peripheral stuff that's all these little blessings out here that you just don't even realize, you know, they're out there. It's just a matter of finding them. Exactly. In everything that we do. Again, I'm, I'm excited to have you on and to talk about a lot of different things that we're talking about. Uh, but first, let's just start out. Let's go back in time really right. quick. Hop into <laughs> that DeLorean. Let's go back in time. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, I'm old, so, you know, it's, it's a ways back there. <laughs> Well, you uh, <laughs> you were telling me earlier that you have like about you know twenty two years that you were in uh, in public safety and dispatch and everything. But right. how did it start out in the beginning? How did you get into it to begin with? You know, it's funny. I I say twenty two years, but uh, the funny thing is that when I was about eleven, my parents started an ambulance company in a little town in Southern California called Blythe, and uh, Blythe Ambulance began and it was run out of our house. So, because there was no office space, they were working, they had, they had full-time jobs, but they knew that the community needed this. Right. Mm -hmm. So they started this ambulance company and the phone number for the ambulance company was our phone number. So when mom and dad were at work and the phone rang, we had to answer the phone. And so at the age of 11, 12 years old, I was literally taking calls and getting our dispatch was at the sheriff's department. So I would have to take the information and call the dispatcher and give them the information so they could send an ambulance. What? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's amazing. I know. I know. Just, I mean, I, I look back on that. I'm like, I, the world was crazy in 1979. Right. And there, there was no, um, there just wasn't 911. You know, we didn't have that. We, you just called the number and right. Yeah. So yeah, we would do that. And, uh, that lasted, I want to say that probably lasted for about a year. And then they got an office and they had the ability to somehow transfer the calls. I, I don't even really remember, mm -hmm. but, um, I, you know, that was one of the things when I had my first oral interview, you know, they're like, well, you know, have you, have you ever dispatched before? I said, well, you know, I mean, like when I was 12, and they just <laughs> went, what? And the <laughs> captain at the time was a good friend of my parents. And he goes, oh yeah, yeah. You guys don't even know what it was like. <laughs> it oh. was the wild west. So, um, yeah, yeah. Literally when I was a girl, but um, when a job, I was, I was a young mom and we needed something and I felt like I needed to do something more, right? I needed to, um, give back. I needed to do something that helped people and the job came up. Um, and so I applied and interviewed and uh, had the most interesting chief's interview that I, oh my gosh. So I told you the captain was a friend of the family, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in my oral board, there's like the, the chief is at his desk and there's the captain and the lieutenant and the records manager. And they're all sitting there 
you know, grilling me. And the cap Grady had warned me and Bob Grady, you're going to listen to this. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm telling on you. Um, he had told me a week before he goes, you know, I saw you singing songs with your daughter in the restaurant. And I think in your interview, I'm going to have you sing some Barney songs. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're sitting there and he says, you know, sometimes as dispatchers, you have to help. You have to like, maybe there's a little kid that gets found and you have to calm him down. And he goes, um, do you think you could sing us some Barney songs, you know, show us how you do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I went off. Went off on, I was screaming at him. I was like, you, you, I told you I didn't want you to do that. Blah, blah, blah. And the chief at the time, God rest his soul, Larry Vanderveer, he hired me anyway. Um, he's sitting there just beat red, doesn't know what's going on. This has all gone sideways, right? <laughs> and Grady's just, he, my captain, he's just laughing. He's just laughing so hard. And everyone else in the room is kind of going, they hired me. So, you know, in later years when they'd be like, you know, yeah, your attitude, blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh, you hired me like this. You knew. <laughs> Full disclosure. <laughs> you were there. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. But that that was my entry into public safety dispatching was just needing something more that would uh, give back to the community. And, and I had inspiration, um, the sheriff's dispatcher, um, again, she's not with us anymore. Name's Linda Wiley. Um, I had called one night from my house. I was young, little girl. There was someone outside. Mom and dad were gone, probably on ambulance stuff. And I called and, and just her voice, you know? Um, being able to keep me calm and get someone there and make sure that um, I was safe. And she was a friend of the family. She worked for my parents part time. You know, it was it's small community thing. And so when they asked me in my chief's interview, you know, why do you want to be a dispatcher? I was like, Linda Wiley. And of course, the captain and the lieutenant go, oh, yeah. And the, and the chief wasn't from there. He goes who's Linda Wiley? And they're like, oh, you know, and they told him all about her. And I said, yeah, her. And they're wow. like, yeah, we get it. So I was lucky, you know, to have people like that around me. So let's go back a little bit. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is an awesome opening. Like, wow. <laughs> you know, just, I, I think I've only uh, spoken to a few people, maybe two or three that had something similar uh a friend of mine um out of south carolina it was it was something similar he remembers being a, you know a kid and like helping dispatch from a home right and, <laughs> so it's, i told you i was old I, well <laughs> you honestly don't look it so okay i'll take it <laughs> so it's it's interesting so for a lot of people who are watching and listening as well you know, 911 started in 1968, but it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a snap of the fingers, right? It, it wasn't right away where 911 was everywhere. Like, there's still probably some places that have to call a, right. a, a phone number, you know, a, a ten-digit line or whatever that for for them to get through, right? Uh, for any type of emergency services. So for you, you know, having. Uh, <laughs> Having had, you know, parents and such who start an ambulance service and you're, you're, you're getting this information as a kid. It, so I have to ask, like going to school, let's just say going to school at mm -hmm. 11 or 12 years old and seeing your friends or whatever, like, Hey, what'd you do over the weekend? Like, would you say like, well, you know, uh, you know I had to, I had to help <laughs> give information for like an ambulance call or something. Like, I can't even imagine doing that and then even maybe talking to friends and saying i've right. done because it's unbelievable right it's just right. weird to think that something like that would happen but it did and there were a lot of places and people right. who did similar things i think that um my parents impressed on us mm -hmm. um from the beginning this is confidential you can't tell people about this you know oh, they were very, very nice. yes. like um 
And I mean, of course, this is before anything like HIPAA or anything like that, but they were True, just right. very like, you can't tell people about mm. this. This is private. This is confidential. And so that was impressed on us. Um, and I think it wasn't really difficult until I was a teenager because um, we we had trauma at the dinner table, right? Mm. I mean, when you don't have any mechanism for uh, critical incident stress management or debriefing or whatever, um, you find a way, right? And so we learned a lot at the dinner table um, about what mom and dad did and the mm -hmm. things that happened. And when there was some horrific thing, you know, like when uh, a guy that I went to school with got killed um, and was in the hospital, it was, you know, my, it was, um, it was difficult to not talk about the things that I knew that other people didn't know. Mm -hmm. As a young girl, it wasn't such a big deal because we were playing on the playground. You know, we really didn't care what the kid did over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah, we true. Like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> we were but um, as a teenager, it became more difficult. And plus, I knew more people because we were new in town. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really know very many people. Um, but yeah, once I did, then it became a little more difficult. Yeah, I can I can imagine like just like you said, you know, with with little kids, yeah, you don't really care <laughs> unless right. a lot of times, you know, and, and I'm just thinking from my own experience being in you know elementary school or whichever middle school that uh, if we ever asked or something, it was it was because we knew like something was going on. Let's just say like the county fair or something, you know? right? Like, what did you do at the fair or whatever? Right. But the, um, I can see where being younger as well and maybe taking those calls transferring it over or however you did it right it really didn't register it's just like when you're when you're a kid and you're watching a movie you don't register all of let's say the adult humor that's in there because you don't understand right you don't get it right yeah. but when you don't you, have any context for that yes so yeah. but as you were saying as you as you got more into your teenage years now you're starting to understand stuff Yes. And things might impact you a little bit different. So I can see we're sitting at the dinner table learning a lot. It's basically comfort, food, and discussion with the family. Yeah. And it you know, was, that, yeah. That really, that's almost your own uh, version of debriefing, you know, Absolutely. in a way. Because you're yeah. there and just mm -hmm. having that time together. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, I think in EMS, um, there's a kind of like in firefighting, you know, when firefighters go on a call, they're a team, right? So they finish their call. They can talk about their call. They eat together. They sleep together. They wash their fire trucks together. Mm -hmm. And back then, I don't really know what it's like now. Um, but back then our EMTs were the same, you know, yeah, they responded from home, mm -hmm. but they were together like a lot. And they, took care of the rigs together. They took transmissions apart together because <laughs> if it broke, you fixed it. <laughs> right. Yeah, and yeah. you know, it's, it's uh, whatever needed to happen. And so there was a, a really super tight camaraderie between them and their kids, right? Like we knew all the kids mm -hmm. of everyone that worked for mom and dad. And we, so we have some similar experiences there with them too. When you started getting older, did you ever talk about some of those things with those kids? Like, did you keep in contact with a lot of them as you guys got older a little bit? Did you ever like kind of reminisce? Like, can you, can you believe like, you know, we were doing this or some of the stuff that we, you know, grew up with? You know, we didn't, we oh. didn't, we, um, I mean, we, uh, like we knew each other. It was a small mm -hmm. town. Yeah. obviously, but I think there was kind of a barrier there because you didn't talk about it, Very you true. know? Yeah. Um, and so there was that kind of barrier between us. We weren't social friends. Uh, we might have mutual friends, but we weren't close friends. We just knew who each other were and knew that we had similar experiences. And if we were at the, the, the ambulance Christmas party, 
you know, then we would socialize, but we're kind of, I don't know, we kind of kept ourselves separate. It's kind of weird. Never thought about that. It kind of, it, I mean, it makes sense in a way, um, you know, I guess th that's kind of what brought all of you together. But in school, you know, it's sometimes with some folks, you're kind of a, another face right. in the hallway, you know, you might say yeah. hello, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you fast forward years later, you know, you, you grow up with this, you've got all of this different experience, hearing things on the radio and everything, and you go in and you go through that interview, you get the job. Did you ever do like a sit along? Did you get in there to see it? Or did you kind of I, already knew or, or know rather what it looked like? I think I went in and I might have sat with someone for a little bit, mm -hmm. but that wasn't a real thing back then. It was um, mid nineties. It was 1994. You didn't really do that. and they, the, that department was very careful about who was in the dispatch center. Um, I had a friend visit, well, he's my husband now, but <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend from high school visit me to introduce me to his new wife um, at the time. And he was a CHP officer. And I knew that. And we had a little clerical gal up front who let him in and his wife, and they came into the dispatch center and my supervisor just about lost her mind. Um, she said, you have to get them out. I was like, well, he's CHP. She goes, I don't care. I don't have a clearance on him. I was like, okay, all right. And you know, <laughs> off they went to the lobby and yeah. she gave me a break. But it was that, um, that level of keeping it confidential and, um, not allowing anyone in. So it was pretty, pretty tight. Sounds kind of intense. Like, <laughs> <A little bit. laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm sure, you know, there are a lot of places that are, you know, still like that, of course, because yeah. they're, I mean, also there's, there's also places where I know that, uh, I had a, I had an officer that I had used to work with and I think he ended up going down to North Carolina. It was, and I asked him, I said, so are you pretty cool friends with any of the dispatchers? over there like you were with us and he goes we're not allowed to like really socialize right. and i said what right and he goes yeah man yeah. and i said that's that kind of sucks in a way because you you kind of put a lot of trust in those folks that you're listening to yes. on either side of the radio and the way we did it in our old yeah. center was that, uh, you know, we had a lot of different disciplines of public safety coming in to see what we do. We would go to see what they do because the more that we understood each other right. and what either one was doing, there was more trust and even more camaraderie there. So for him to say that, I thought, man, that kind of sucks. He goes, wow. yeah, he goes, I love the job. He goes, it just kind of sucks that we don't have that level of, uh, I guess, unity and camaraderie as, right. as with you guys. I was like, Eesh. Yeah. Yeah. We kind of went through cycles of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it, it would change because of behavior. Mm. Uh, I think that there were, that makes a sense. Couple, you know, there's always that one guy that spoils it for everybody. <laughs> How dare they? <laughs> and that happens. And, and, you know, there were times that I would have a watch commander who could sit there and we could talk about stuff. We could talk about family stuff. We could talk about work stuff. We, you know, you'd have that, uh, like you said, that camaraderie, um, mm -hmm. I had that with just about any of my, uh, watch commanders, you know, and the guys could come in and sit there while I did their teletype or, you know, whatever it was. Um, but there were a couple of sergeants, well, one <laughs> really who just, if any officer was standing in dispatch, he would just kind of lose his mind and be like, you have to get out of here. I'd be like, but he's giving me the information for the Kletz entry. I kind of need to <laughs> right. talk to him, right? <laughs> and he would just, it doesn't matter. I'm like, okay, here, um, why don't you fill out this form and just bring it back to me? And, you know, um, and it, so it, it really is dependent uh, sometimes on who you're working with and, and what they Very want true. their shift to look like, maybe. I don't know. 
No, that, and you know what? That makes sense as well. Uh, you know, there were some sergeants that I worked with that were kind of like that as well. They're like, if you need something, just send it to them over the, the MCT, over the computer right. or something. Or, or, call, or call or call her. I'm like, yeah, because I don't have enough phone lines to answer. <laughs> right. I'm a solo dispatcher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? So, yeah, that's another thing. People yeah. would call up and go, dude, yeah. either you Seriously? figure out how yeah. to do this on your own time or you f fax it up here or yep. something. something. Okay. Hold on. I have to say this really okay. quick as we're talking, because anyone who is watching and listening to this right now, you have mentioned teletype and I have mentioned faxing. So the <laughs> they're like, what are you talking about? I know. Yeah. And <laughs> and uh, it's still in like from 2001 all the way up until the time. Well, not all the way up until the time. It was probably more like oh, 2008 or something at the other center that I was at. We still had that teletype with the dot matrix, the yes. printer that was like ring, the long ring, form. Ring, ring, yes, ring. <laughs> you had to check it all the time to make sure you yeah. weren't missing something. And yeah. if somebody, if someone gave you the uh, common name of Smith, and oh man, and especially our system, so sometimes they would give us multiple people to run, right? Like anybody right. else, but with our system specifically, and maybe there's others that have the same thing. You couldn't run that second one until the first one was done. So if somebody ran a Smith and it was a drunk driving grant or clicked their ticket or whatever that was going on, yeah, you were going to be there forever. forever. And then the officers, uh, Central, do you have anything back yet? And you're thinking, <laughs> you gave me a Smith, man. <laughs> like, dude, seriously? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, you're not going to get anything back for a little right. while. <laughs> Come hang in dispatch for a while. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. What the yeah. heck, man? But. When you uh, when you ended up getting in there though, because you said this is 1994, right? So yeah. you're you're in there now. When you walked in, let's just let's go to that moment. Sure. Because um, a couple things here. One, I want to know what it was like for you when you finally got in there. If it was, um, if anything surprised you, right? Anything right away? Sure. If there was anything that surprised you. But secondly, what do you see when you walk in? Are there multiple monitors? Are there just like right. sounds going all over the place? What it is that you see to kind of paint the picture for those who are watching and listening? So, uh, so this is the nineties. We didn't have, we didn't have the internet in mm -hmm. there. We didn't have, uh, we didn't have a PC with a mouse. Uh, so you walked, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Right. You walked in and there's, um, a computer where you type in the the calls and it's of course it's all dos based stuff oh yes <laughs> and there's a radio console that is an it it's a radio console motorola radio console right the old with the buttons and everything and you had to program the tones to send out the fire trucks or the ambulances and um you know foot pedal for the mic and then there was like our computer and the county's computer Mm -hmm. And I think there was there was a monitor for nine one one, but it was still DOS based, right? It was still the old DOS based nine one one, and the desks were probably from the fifties. I mean, it was this ginormous, heavy wooden desk with a glass thing over it, and all the critical information you needed was under that glass, right? You had to you're like, oh, which which thing here? <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was, uh, old and funky and, the the, uh, the phone, uh, electronics were all behind us, uh, just all right there, all the electronics, all the computers, everything was all in this one room. And so it was, uh, it was this tight, old, funky space, right? And a window out to the front so that you could talk to whoever's covering the the front desk the counter oh, good you had a window so that well, we had a window well part of a window yeah we had a <laughs> window else. and then there's a window to the lobby so you could kind of see <clears> in the <throat> lobby um and uh so you kind of knew who was coming in um but it was overwhelming i'd never really seen anything like that so it was overwhelming a little bit and 
I, I have to give kudos to my trainer. She might've been mean and bitter, but, <laughs> um, it's my first, I want to say probably two weeks, maybe longer were spent reading all the manuals, You're, all the binders, all the manuals, the NCIC, the clets, the inlets, the, the everything like uh, she literally had me sit there and just flip pages, the policy and procedure manual, the everything. Um, yeah. And I think she just wanted me to be able to speak the language. I mean, I was at that time, I was married to an EMT. Mm-hmm. My parents owned an ambulance company. I knew all the guys I grew up there. So these are guys that I either went to high school with or I went to high school with their wives or, you know, so I was very familiar with who was there. And I, I spoke a minimum of 10 code. Um, I mean, I'd lived with the scanner since I was 11. Right. But she wanted me to be able to speak the language. And that was people say, oh, my gosh, why did you read all that stuff? I had to know where, I, where to find the answer. If someone called me and asked me a question, she just wanted me able to, to speak the language and to know where to find the answer. Overwhelming. I I I feel you because I remember those manuals and and some folks who had yeah. been there for years prior to me going and uh, looking at some of those manuals and <laughs> I yeah. remember I remember thinking damn this manual stinks like this. <laughs> it smelled right yes. and like one one policy you would go to turn it and it would just like disintegrate Shred. i'm like maybe yeah. we should like update that one at least put maybe it on a new one paper you know <laughs> <laughs> oh the, man the list of all the oris right oh because that was the only way you could find it was you had to look in the book right? and you had to find their ORI so you could send them a teletype <laughs> to confirm the warrant. Yes. Oh my, you are taking <laughs> me back for sure. Like even, so even at the, the center that I was at, I mean, we, it was, we had all of that. I'm sure all centers have it, but it was, it was, we had to memorize pretty much everything because it wasn't one thing Uh, or it was one thing just to know where to look for it. Right. Mm -hmm. But when you're in a hurry and you're in nine on one, if you have it memorized, Oh, you can move super fast. Yeah. And also for those who are watching and listening, the, uh, the DOS base that Elizabeth is talking about, just imagine a smaller screen. It's all black and what's text or any lines or anything is like a neon green. And yeah. you basically have to memorize a lot of those incident command codes, like the townships, all of that stuff, because mm-hmm. some of those systems, you couldn't move forward with entering the complaint until you had those things right. Right. And <laughs> that's why you had to memorize as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, entering, man. entering a stolen car and knowing what order to put the codes in with the dot in between so oh. that it went in and, and got entered. And if you messed it up, you just had to start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> oh my heavens. <laughs> oh man. You're making my anxiety go up now. Oh, sorry. Like, sorry. No, I'm just playing. I'm joking. No panic attacks, please. <laughs> I know. right? Like, no, you're taking me back. <laughs> yeah. That's why I say just, life is good now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, technology yeah. has definitely uh, gotten way better and everything. Um, yeah. So you're, you're in there, you're learning all of these different things you go through. What were some of the first like phone calls that you, that you took? Do you remember any of those earlier ones? You know, I remember, um, I don't, I don't really remember the stuff from training, but mm-hmm. I remember, um, I couldn't give you a date, but not long after I was cut loose from training, um, there were a couple of calls that were just, uh, just awful. And one of them was that, um, my dad's best friend died and it was an unattended death. And, um, I get this call and it's from the previous chief and, you know, he says, Hey, um, I'm over at Bill's house and, uh, and he's gone. 
And that was how I found out that uncle Bill died. Right. Wow. And, um, I, I remember putting the information out, you know, for, for a response and just sobbing as I was trying to get this information out. And, um, you know, one of the guys came in and was like, are you okay? I'm like, yes, I'll be fine. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I I remember that one so vividly. Um, and uh, Bob Feemster, the former chief. So many of these people are just gone now. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're no longer with us. But um, he was very kind. And and then we had another one that was really awful. We had a a little girl that drowned in the hot tub at one of the hotels. Her hair had gotten caught in the drain. Um, and she was the child of the uh, housekeeper and I knew her mom. And so, you know, doing that, that was, uh, just for being in the middle of the desert, that's a lot of drownings. Like that was like a, because the river's there, but Mm -hmm. there's pools and canals and, and, uh, I remember having a conversation with my mom one day, mom, I, I just can't do any more of these children drowning. And, uh, that's a whole nother conversation about how I got into child passenger safety and child safety. So yeah. I feel like, well, you know what, I'll, I'll just go ahead and ask, um, do you feel like it was because you're now in the profession as well? even though, you know, a different discipline of public safety, right? But your parents had dealt with and seen many, many things, experienced many things. And you just mentioning that little bit of a conversation that you have with your mom, do you feel like it helped having them in the profession as well to be able to talk with them and having someone that understood what it was that you were going through? Absolutely. 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 Without a doubt. Um, my mom was someone that I could talk to. She, she, she would sit and pray with me, you know, to help me get through whatever's going on. My dad, um, even after his strokes and stuff, uh, I could talk to him about anything, you know, and, and funny, even when he had dementia, it was like, that would bring him back into a space where he could give me advice and, Mm -hmm. and we could talk about things, um, important things. And my first husband, he, he was an EMT and, and, uh, he went through paramedic school and, and we both, uh, had received some, uh, peer support training. And so we would kind of give that care to each other that, debrief the, uh, be able to talk about things and hard calls. So it made a huge difference. I love that. I love that you were able to get that out, that you had somebody there, you know, that understood, yeah. you know, a few different people. Cause, uh, you know, even, even myself starting in 2001, um, no one ever talked to me about, hey, so, I mean, you're going to be taking some crazy calls. But uh, right. no one, there was never a mention of what is said now is self-care or right. even mental health and wellness. Like, that That wasn't even, it wasn't a thing. And uh, yeah. you know, no one really talked about it. And uh, I don't know if you remember any terms like that during that time at all. But the fact that you had people there and folks that were willing to talk to you, but more so because they understood Right. And that I'm sure not only helped you, but also helped other coworkers that you might've spoken to later on. Yeah. I think, um, once the kind of the old guard, uh, retired, mm-hmm. then one of the things that happened was, um, I don't know if, I, have you ever met Janet Childs or Joel Fay? Um, you know, the names sound kind of familiar. Yeah. So Janet Childs is a pioneer in the field of critical incident stress management and peer support. And I think I want to say probably about, um, 1998 Mm -hmm. might've been later. I I don't really remember. I got to go to a training and Janet was there and we had two, I think it was the three day, might've been the two day or the three day, 
um, I got to go to two trainings that her organization had put on and learned tools, right? Learned how to not only help myself, but help the people around me. And my department sent me to that. They, I don't even know, uh, I don't know what talked them into doing that. Maybe I just needed post hours and they found something. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be a huge turning point for our department because now we had, I went and my friend Victor went, and now we had people in our department that you could trust to talk to, right? And who um, we got to just, I don't know, just be the ear, the listening ear, but also taught us how to take care of ourselves. Again, I, yeah. I love that because a lot of places, you know, they don't have that. And yes. even today. And I worked for don't. one of those too. It's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I, and I can imagine because there was, I had heard about, you know, different places where people would just say, oh, this is, this is what you signed up for, you know, yes. go to the next one. You'll be all right. I'm like, yep. Okay. You know, and uh, I just, I, I always go back to also a, another example of my own where uh, my my team and I, we had gone through something and uh, they had a, a counselor from EAP come and, and talk to mm -hmm. us. And uh, the I, I'm sure, you know, no disrespect to this gentleman, I'm sure he's a great counselor, but he didn't come from public safety. He didn't come from 911 at all. Mm. And, uh, you know, yeah. it just immediately was like, well, how does all of this make you guys feel? And we're just, okay. And, <laughs> and so I, we ended up telling him, I don't think this is going to work because you don't come yeah. from where we come from. And, and he agreed. He also yeah. agreed and said, no, you're right. You know, I, I don't understand. And it probably would be better for you guys to find someone who comes from where you come yeah. from. And, and we parted ways. And so, so that was a good thing that, you know, the counselor actually agreed because. Right. You know, he understood. Go ahead. Oh, he understood he wasn't culturally competent. Right. Yeah. And there yeah. are others who just kind of have that ego who are like, no, I'm here. I'm going to help you. And we're, we're going to do whatever. And mm -hmm. it doesn't end up being the best, you know, yeah. experience. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you as well, as, as we were kind of talking about what it was like for you walking in and what you're seeing and everything, how many people worked on the floor at a time? Was it single or were there multiple people? <laughs> I like how you, uh, you say that on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> it was a cupboard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. was, I was in a closet. There was no windows. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was it was like half of a room and the other half was the records department, right? Yeah. I mean, it was, this, yeah. Uh, it was solo dispatch. Oh, okay. Solo dispatch. And um, so at the time, there was no separate EMS dispatch. And so Blythe Police Department dispatched police and fire for the city mm -hmm. and then uh, medical for a third of Riverside counties and part of San Bernardino and Imperial counties. So um, the area that the, our area of influence was, I don't even know how many hundred square miles. It was 50 miles one way and 50 miles one way and 50 miles one way. And, you know, it was huge. Um, yeah. yeah, I was going to say a portion of San Bernardino, I can just imagine that that, was, right. that alone was probably uh, yeah. pretty, pretty uh, busy. Yeah, we had, um, because Blythe is south of Needles, mm -hmm. California. So Needles is in San Bernardino County and, and we would kind of meet in the middle there. Um, yeah. Wow. And so, okay, so then one person and were you doing eight hour shifts or 12 hour shifts? We were doing five eights and we had this crazy rotation. Um, you would do three months. So it was, it was, you know, midnight to eight, eight to four, four to midnight. Right. And you would do three months of graveyard and then you would do three months of day shift and then you would do three months of swing shift. And then you did three months of relief oh, and man. relief check this out relief was swing swing day graveyard graveyard what <laughs> yeah yeah so eight to midnight or four to midnight two days 
Then you get off at midnight, you come back at eight in the morning and you work your day shift and you get off at four. And then you come back at midnight and work a graveyard and then another graveyard and then you're done. So <laughs> I know, I know it's like, they don't do that anymore. They got rid wow. of that down there. Um, I can see why. <laughs> yeah. You know, you spent your whole Friday and part of Saturday just recovering and but you didn't have to go back till 4 p.m. on Monday. Yeah. You know, it was all like concentrated. <laughs> um, and they're still doing five eights there. So I I can relate a little bit because when I very first started dispatching, uh, I was out in uh, central Florida at a small police department, one seater, eight hour shifts. Yep. But we changed every two weeks. And, oh my uh, gosh. Yeah, it was uh it was 6A to 2P, 2P to 10P and then 10P to 6A. <laughs> Look at you. Oh. <laughs> it's like, no. it's like you're getting ready to do some ohms, oh. like meditate it out. <laughs> I'm going to have to go breathe for a minute. I'll be back. <laughs> right. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, and so that it would be 10P to 6A for that midnight shift and when you got to midnights, you were on that for a month. And then you went straight to days. And uh, it, I mean, even with you, you know, and, and yeah. any shift, it's hard to plan stuff, right? Yep. So that that wasn't a lot of fun, but uh, yeah. <laughs> that's the way it was where we were at. Wow. <laughs> the, the thing I did like about it was mm -hmm. I could plan because I could tell you, okay, I'm working this shift right now. I could tell you a year from now what my days off would be. Oh. Right. Because if you were on day shift, your days off were always, um, I think Wednesday, Thursday. So you always knew you could plan something and know, well, let's see. Okay. I'm going to rotate here and here and here. So this is where I'll, yeah, it was very easy to plan. There was no, there was no seniority in it. You just rotated through and it was kind of equalizing, I think. Wow. So, you know, you, you go through all of these years and everything, you've got all this experience and everything. Do you, is there a call? And of course, uh, as long as you feel comfortable talking about it, is there a call that just kind of sticks with you? Um, there's a few mm -hmm. and interestingly, the ones that really stick with me are not the ones from Blythe. Mm -hmm. Um, Blythe Police Department became a place. It, I can still go there and I can still walk in the front door and say, hey, it's Elizabeth. And they click the door for me because these are my people, right? Yeah. Uh, for a long time. But I had left and moved to Idaho. And then my first love found me. Uh, and we rekindled that. And he moved me back here to California. Mm -hmm. And so I applied for a job at Arcata Police Department, which is, um, I don't know if you know where uh, Eureka, California is on the coast, Humboldt Bay. Uh, I think I've, the, I've probably been out there. <laughs> I've been out there a lot. On, it's, on the yeah. West coast. So, um, but Arcata is just north. It's on the bay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, oh, this is going to be wonderful. And Arcata, it was like the Wild West. Like there were uh, home invasion robberies and shootings and uh, so many transients because it's the pot capital of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so there were all of these uh, schizophrenic people and just so much mental health issues and so the calls there are the ones that just, they, there was no peer support. I requested a debrief and, and was told no several times, but there are a couple, there was a, uh, there was a man that a lady opened her door and there was a man dying on her stoop from a stabbing. Um, there was a, one of my, you know, those good people that you talk to every night because they're drunk and they have to talk. And so yeah. you, yeah. Hey, how's it going? You know? Okay, Steven. Yeah. Okay. Um, and one night his house caught fire and he died in there. And I went through this unexpected grief 
right? Because I talk to him every night. Mm -hmm. And I, I still can tell you what is, I can hear his voice, you know. Um, but the, the hardest one was um, the last one. It was um, my husband now, uh, he's a, he is retired now, but he was a CHP sergeant and mm -hmm. he was the area commander standing in as the area commander at the time. And one of his guys got shot. And of course, in a small county, everyone's got their scanner on and the calls roll over to the next town. And so everyone is, you're involved in the call. Not only do you hear him over the scanner giving out his 1199, um, but the calls start rolling in and I froze. When I heard him on the scanner, I froze and I was incapable of doing my job. I, uh, you know, all I could do was yell for my friend to pray. And, and she came in and held my hand and prayed. And, and I was finally able to put the information out. Um, but, and they asked me to stay that night. They're like, Hey, can you, so-and-so sick? Can you just stay? And I was like, uh, I didn't have choice. And yeah. so I stayed. And the next day I tried to go to work and I pulled in the parking lot and just cried. And I went in, put on the headset, you know, put on the headset and you sit down and you do your job. And one of the guys had a bad radio and he, I told him, I said, you got to go change that radio out. You, you got to, I, I can't hear you. And he didn't. And he went on a call and I status checked him and there was no answer. And as soon as I knew he was code for, as soon as I knew he was safe, I was done. I ripped my headset off and I walked into the other Lieutenant's office, the one that I hadn't been refused help from. And that was my last day. That was my last day. It was uh, November 2nd, 2015. It was tough. Oh, man. Yeah. The officer lived. Um, he retired from that um, and is a good guy. Uh, we check in with each other on November 1st. Um, but yeah, that's the one. That's the one. So when you, when you end up going in there to speak to that person, to say that you're done, I guess, what was their reaction? Did they try to get you to stay? Did they try to say, you know, we can get someone to talk to you or did they simply understand and just say, if this is, if that's how you feel, you know, if these are your wishes, then we'll, you know, we'll go ahead and, right. and, and accept your resignation. Um, he uh, actually, um, he was so kind. Mm -hmm. And I think that he realized what was going on because I'm pretty sure I was babbling. You know, I, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. I can't, you know, I can't keep them safe. I don't know what to do. And, and uh, I don't really remember a lot of it. I do remember him having the detective sergeant come and stand right here. And I remember him covering his firearm. And that was when I realized that this is, this is not okay. I'm not okay. Um, it was more than, um, it was more than these guys, they never answer, you know, gosh, they don't answer their radios. And it was more than that. And he knew that I was not okay. And he called my husband. He said, Martin, you need to come get Elizabeth. Um, I'm not going to let her drive the way she is. And so he came and got me and um, Lieutenant gave us brochures on EAP and he started a workers comp case for me. Um, he, he did the things right that we trust them to do. 
sorry. Um, he did the things Mm -hmm. and he got me started down a road that eventually got me the help that I needed. It took a while. You know, I was, I was probably, uh, on my couch for six months, just not able the, you know, uh, I call it spaghetti brain. You know, there's, there's just noodles. There was nothing. I didn't have anything for anyone. Um, yeah, but, uh, I just, I give him credit for seeing and recognizing what was going on and starting the process of getting me what I needed. And I never walked back in there yet. I've still never walked back into Arcata Police Department. But I do know that he's the chief now and that they have a peer support program and they get the help that they need. They have a good EAP and they're contracted with culturally competent clinicians. And so I, you know, I look at that and I think, gosh, you know, it does have a good ending yes. for the people that are still there. And I'm super grateful for that. I just found that out like a month ago <laughs> from a friend of mine that, that works there. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's like how we were talking in the very beginning of this episode. There's always a silver lining. You got to find that right. silver lining in, you know, this is almost like it, in a way, um, kind of a full circle type you know, situation yeah. where, yes, you went through this, you had the support there and you worked through all of it. And maybe that was one of the main pieces that led to everything that is there now. Absolutely. Who are, uh, you know, within the trenches of 911, still continuing right. to do and, and work in the profession and able to get help. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. And, sure. uh, so you, you end up going through this, you know, you, yeah. you get that help and you're working on yourself really, you know, and, and a lot of times yeah. I think there's, there's a lot of us who, uh, and I'm sure we've all been at some point where you don't ever want to look in the mirror and think, is it me? Like, do it, do I need to fix something? And then right. you know, maybe one day you realize, okay, I do need to do something. Yeah. And, um, you know, you went through what you went through and now you've, so you've, you've transitioned out. You ended up retiring out of, mm -hmm. of dispatch. You worked on yourself and everything. Yep. What are the things that you are doing now? So, um, well, for one, I garden. <laughs> That's, I'm a grandma. I get to be a grandma, uh, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, we have, his and hers kids, mm -hmm. right? Since we found each other again, just, we just had our ninth anniversary. Congratulations. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Um, so we have his and hers kids and one of them has kids. And so they moved, mine moved up here. So we have grandkids here. Um, and I started writing. Uh, it started with a I've always written, like I've, I've always journaled and written songs and poetry and stuff like that. But I wrote this poem and we were on our way south to a baby shower for our first grandchild. And I wrote this poem and then, I don't know, a while later I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to make her a little book, right? So I did some sketches and... And you can't see me, but I'm talking with my hands. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell, but I am. Uh, I, I made some sketches and my husband said, you know, what if you turn that into a real book? I said, oh gosh, you know, I'm not, I'm not an artist by any means, but um, so I started looking for publishers and I found this one and uh, did the self-publishing thing. And, um, they had illustrators that just, um, made beautiful, beautiful artwork out of my ideas. And I couldn't be happier with it. It's, it's, it's this blue one right, right there. It's called oh, to the moon and back. Very nice. And the artwork on the front is my daughter's, uh, work. I wanted that to be the cover. So that is um, excellent. and it's, it's really, uh, just a fun little book. 
Um, and so what I had is something that I had been writing for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I had learned from a friend of mine when the kids were little, she had taught me, um, I, I came to her and I was just, I was distraught. I don't even remember what it was about, but she said, come on in, let's sit down. So she came and she sat me, sat me down and coffeed me up. Right. <laughs> and said, let's talk. And so she was the one that taught me how to find the blessings in everything. Right. She said, it's, it's there. It's there for you. You just have to learn how to find it. You have to learn how to look for it. And so I had been writing this book probably for, well, for a long time. We'll just say for a long time, probably 10 <laughs> years. I had been working on this This book is what it turned out to be. It started out as just me writing and, and it turned into a book. And so that's that's the other one that you can see here, Finding the Blessings. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a devotional book um, about being able to tune in a little to the Holy spirit and be able to just see the things around you and be more aware of them. And, uh, I was talking to someone on Sunday and I, you know, praying over her and saying, you know, let's, I, I want you to be able to find the blessings, God, you know, let her find the blessings, even if it's a flower sticking up out of the side of the road. Right. You know, yeah. Right? Silver lining right there. It's, it's yeah. Something. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. And so, um, that's how that book took me a long time. And, uh, I ended up doing that one through Kindle direct publishing. So it's more, um, it's me, you know, it's, uh, the other one's just a poem. So it's me. You know, that was, that was easy, but this one is, I didn't get a real copy edit on it. Someday I'll, I'll send it through, um, probably my current publisher and have them really do a copy edit on it and, and put out a better product, I think. But my current project is a devotional for dispatchers. And I had gone through a, a course of how to write devotions and I'm part of a compilation book that's coming out this fall for Advent. And I realized that, you know, I, I need to do this. And so I Googled it. I thought, oh, I'll see how many there are out there. Do you know how many devotional books there are out there for dispatchers? Yeah, probably none. <laughs> I was going to say it's yours, a, one. It's a big fat zero. <laughs> yeah. It's a big fat. For all that we go through and for all that we affect other people's lives every day, right? And we absorb so many people's pain and anger and confusion. And, you know, you absorb that. Um, there was nothing. And I was just floored. And so now there will be. That is amazing. I'm I'm excited for that. I Thanks. am looking forward to it. And uh, just having you on, this has been, I could talk to you for hours. Like this was, <laughs> Thanks. this has been awesome. I mean, we could have been coworkers, man. Like this I know, is, right? <laughs> this is really good. And yeah. uh, so I, I've got two last questions for you as, as we go into the wrap up of this episode. Uh, first off, again, Thank you for being on and, and for sharing your story. I know that there are a lot of folks that will hear this and uh, be inspired to also kind of look at themselves and see if maybe they need to um, seek some sort of help, whether it be sure. going to speak to a therapist or even just yep. talking to a family member or some or coworker or something, someone right. to be able to talk to and get it out there when they're, when they're ready, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, and especially the fact that you knew that something needed to change. Right. And, and the other thing that I love about that is that you walked in and you took the initiative. There's a lot of times that people don't. They just end up yeah. thinking, oh, I'll just get past it, you know? And then it just yeah. starts to build or up. Or I'll just build up. Right. Yeah. Or yeah. that. And then never do anything with it again right. uh, until, you know, they things start getting worse or whichever. So for anyone out there who might be 
I guess, on the fence of talking to someone. Mm-hmm. I mean, what is what is just your thoughts? What what advice would you give? I would say that one of the best things that I ever did was to sit down with a culturally competent clinician. Okay. (laughs) It's a lot of C's. Um, But seriously, Mm -hmm. she spoke my language. She understood the environment we live in here in Humboldt, which is the Wild West. (laughs) Um, But she walked me through and That is so critical. And one of the things that I would also say is it's okay to ask for help. Asking for help does not make you weak. Asking for help or going to see someone who can help you ask for help Mm -hmm. um, does not make you weak. And it doesn't make you unable to do your job. It doesn't mean that you um, are broken. You know, the thing we run into, the stigma that's attached to post-traumatic stress is huge. You know, you break your arm and what happens? People sign your cast and they're like, oh, let's bring her dinner. And, you know, what? can we come to your housework for you? Because we know that you can't. And so they do all those things, right? But when you break your heart, it's crickets. They don't know how. They don't know how to serve you. To um, They don't think that they can because, oh, it's probably all confidential. And, you know, it's, it's kind of weird, but it's true. You know, when we break our heart and I I say our heart and not our head, but it really is a, there is an injury there. Mm -hmm. Now they've reclassified it. Um, People just don't understand. So please, please don't be afraid to ask for help because it doesn't make you weak. If you're if your agency has an EAP, you can call your EAP and most of them will give you 12 counseling sessions for free and all your boss knows is that somebody got help. They don't know who, they don't know why, they don't know any of the details. They literally get a statement that says 12 counseling sessions. Boom. That's all they know. I don't know that they even know that. Um, they know someone called and got help. So if you have an EMP, EAP, that's huge. Um, work comp can be difficult. If you think you need that level of help, then I say do it. It made all the difference for me. Um, yeah. Get the Excellent. help. Talk to somebody. Talk to If you have peer counselors in your agency, go for it. If you need to call the First Responder Support Network, um, frsn.org, I think, but it's frsn. If you need to call them, you call them. They have resources. Um, the Bill Wilson Center for Living on Living with Dying, they actually do a lot of first responder work, um, and they have resources. There's the text helpline. You can text badge. Uh, I won't know the number, but um, I can get it to you. But you can text badge to this number, and you will have a, a clinician on the other end of the text helpline who's culturally competent and understands law enforcement, and they will talk to you. There's so much out there. So many resources. Yes. Yeah. Way more than, uh, than w- when we both oh first started. God. Right. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much for that. And, uh, yeah. the last question that I have is, is for you specifically. And, uh, with your 22 years yeah. of experience, if you could go back in time to talk to yourself mm. in the beginning yeah. What advice would you give yourself? And it's not to change anything, just right. to simply give yourself some guidance. What would you tell yourself? Oh gosh, that's a good one. Um, I think if I could talk to her, hmm, 
I would probably tell her that it's going to be okay. Mm. That you are going to experience other people's lives in a way that nobody else can. You are going to know intimate details of what's going on in other people's lives that nobody else knows. You're going to experience intimate moments with complete strangers. And all of that is going to change you. And it's okay. Because you're going to become what it is that God has for you. You will grow into it and you will get there. That's probably what I would tell her. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> um, now I need a tissue. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Same. Oh, man. <sighs> oh, that was a powerful one. Thank you Thanks. so much for for your experience, your expertise, everything that you're doing now and will continue to do. Thank you so, so very much. Um, for those who are watching and listening, though, how can they get a hold of you or find out more about what it is that you're doing, any of the books that are available and any that will be coming up? I mean, you've got a blog as well. There's a website. How can people find out uh, more about you? So the easiest way is uh, to go to my website. It's uh, blessedandrestored.com. Mm -hmm. And you'll see my blog. My There's links to my books there. Um, I, I actually have to, I actually have to go in and, and check that out because, uh, I, uh, like you have switched publishers <laughs> <laughs> and so I need to make sure, um, I don't know, uh, if the links are still right for the books, but anyone could, uh, email me through my blog and I would totally, uh, sell and ship books from here. I have definitely have a supply, but blessedandrestored.com and my blog is there and I have an email. If someone needs to contact me, needs some more information, um, needs a resource. Perfect. Thank you again for being on. This has been an amazing and powerful episode and I just, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will be right back here with you in just one moment. And for those who are watching and listening, if you have any comments, questions, or you ever want to be a guest on the show, you can email me. And that is going to be wttpodcast at gmail.com. Once again, that is wttpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow on social media. You can also become a supporter of the podcast, all that good stuff. Just simply go to links.co slash wttpodcast. And that's links with two eyes dot co slash wtt podcast and you'll find everything there email social media where to hear the uh, latest episode where to find the links for the new and ricardo version books of imagine listening as well as um where you can also sign up to be a guest on the podcast whether you are new to dispatch seasoned retired i want to share your story i've been doing this for over a decade now it is my passion and uh, i want to share your story to literally the world and uh, i look forward to talking to you you can also find the podcast and dispatch merchandise off of there and again that is links with two eyes.co slash wtt podcast this episode has been sponsored by in digital a leader next gen core services and shout out as always to subscribers of the podcast and this can be seen on uh, youtube x as well as facebook and uh, LinkedIn Live. You can listen 24-7 on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, your favorite podcasting app, and within the trenches.net. Have a good one, everyone, and we will see you all in the next one. You just listened to a Code 7 Network podcast. If you have any questions or would like to be a guest on the show, send an email to wttpodcast at gmail.com.